Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Madeira. I'm the Academic Specialist for High Impact Practices from the Office of Academic Affairs. I want to welcome you to today's event, Cancer and You. This is the 17th event held within a three-week period as part of the Common Read Initiative. Almost everyone knows someone who has been diagnosed with cancer. But do you really know what it is? Do you know how to prevent cancer? Are you familiar with the newest cancer treatments? I'm glad you're here today because we are here to learn about what causes cancer, the ways to protect yourself, and the novel medical advancements from both scientific and medical viewpoints. Today, our speakers are Dr. Peter Novick from the Biology and Geology Department and Dr. Alana Coglin from Brantford, North Brantford Pediatrics, Yale New Haven Children's Hospital, attending at Yale School of Medicine and clinical instructor. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, as Susan stated, my name is uh, Dr. Novick, and I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you for coming. This is my third year at Queensborough Community College, and having taught intro to bio for such a long time to both majors and non-majors, uh, I, I realize that the campus is quite diverse in both ethnic, religious, cultural backgrounds. And with these different backgrounds come a lot of different beliefs and misconceptions when it comes to different topics. And today we're going to talk about some different beliefs and misconceptions of cancer. We're going to talk about what is cancer, what causes cancer, how do we treat cancer, and some ways that you can prevent it. So again, <clears throat> I'm here representing the biology department, and this is my cousin, Dr. Alana Coughlin. If you want to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you so much for having me. When Peter called a few months ago and said, come on, we could work on this project, it, it was just very exciting to have the opportunity to come here today and, and uh, to work together. I grew up on Long Island, but currently, for the last 15 years, have been up in Connecticut, where I uh, practice and and teach, and so again, thank you for having me today. Thank you. So before we start, I need to basically put in a little disclaimer, because we are not here to specifically diagnose, treat, or provide individual medical advice. We're here just to educate you on the current biological and medical information on cancer, how to treat cancer, and ways to prevent cancer. If you have any personal concerns or issues, please feel free to contact your own physician. Now, before we start, it would be a good idea to have a little bit of a quiz. This is a campus, right? So let's have a little bit of a quiz. I don't need anybody to raise their hands. I don't need anybody to shout answers out. I want you to think in your own mind. And I want you to see if you know the answers to these trivia questions dealing with cancer. So the first one, some injuries can cause cancer later in life. Well, for those of you who said false, you're correct. Most cancers are traced due to genetic changes that are independent of physical injuries. So things like bruises and scrapes and cuts and so on will not lead to any sort of a cancer. Our next is all cancers are the same. That is false. There are hundreds, greater than 100, types of different cancers with so many different treatments, many of which we'll uh, touch upon today. So when some, what someone does as a young adult has little effect on their chance of getting cancer later in life. Well, everybody should know that that's false. Some of our most common cancers, like skin cancer and lung cancer, are due to exposures to the sun or to chemicals in cigarette smoke and tobacco. So what you do as a young adult can have a major impact on your uh, chance of developing cancer later in life. Cell phones and electronic devices can cause cancer. This is false. Studies that correlate brain cancer and cell phone use are incredibly difficult to conduct, uh, but a Danish cancer society actually fairly recently uh, did study this and, and did not find any link between the two. Any lumps or large masses that you find in your body are cancerous. 
as indeed is false. Everybody has some sort of a mark or mass cyst, something that is completely harmless. It could be a cyst that your body is just going to reabsorb. It might be something that is benign, which is essentially harmless. Um, it could be precancerous, or it could be cancerous. This is why screenings are important. But not every lump or mass that you find in your body are going to be cancerous. I have, I have moles on my body. I prefer to call them beauty marks. But everybody has some sort of a mark or a blemish on their body. A positive attitude can cure you of cancer without any additional treatments. And this is false. While a positive attitude can have an extremely important role in coping with an illness and may influence outcome, it has never been shown to either cure a cancer or to shrink a tumor. Cancer is contagious. False. There are no human cancers that are contagious. There are some cancers in other animals. One most documented is from the Tasmanian devil, uh, where it is actually transferred from one body to another, from one animal to the other animal. But in humans, there's no such thing. So spending time with somebody who has cancer is going to be very beneficial. It will not give you cancer. Only women can get breast cancer. That is false. Women are more than 100 times more likely than men to get breast cancer, but because both men and women have breast tissue, they can both get breast cancer. Uh, the, according to the American Cancer Society, each year about 2,000 men uh, are diagnosed with breast cancer. Good people don't get cancer. <laughs> they, some of these are serious. A lot of people think this. A lot of people think this. This is false. For a long time, it was thought that illness was brought on by doing bad things and being a bad person. But if that was the case, then how could you explain newborn babies being born with cancer? How can you explain innocent children who have cancer? <clears throat> Oops. So I was talking to a coworker right here yesterday, Dr. Trujillo, and she said to me, this is such a great event that we're doing for students, learning about cancer, because this is not something that's going away. This is not something that is that, that, that is, is something that's going to go away right away, because this is still an issue today. In the United States, currently, there are more than about, about 12 million men and women alive who have a history of cancer. Currently, the median age at diagnosis for cancer was 66, and the median age at death for cancer was 72. For 2012, it was estimated that the new cases of cancer was over 1.5 million and the deaths were over 0.5 million. So what is cancer? We keep saying this term cancer. Cancer was once a word that people were afraid to speak of in public, and people rarely admitted to being a cancer survivor. Speaking to some of my current students, they said that in their cultures, in certain cultures, you still don't talk about it. There's actually a, a TV show called The Big C, because historically, people used to call it the big C. This is um, what we call a superstitious euphemism. Superstitious is um, a belief due to ignorance, and a euphemism is a way to make something sound less harsh. So people would say the big C because it sounded a lot better than saying cancer, and they thought if they said it, then they would get it themselves. So people rarely admitted to having cancer. So cancer is, in fact, a term that we use for diseases in which abnormal cells, cells that have been mutated, will divide without any control mechanism. And they can invade other healthy tissues. They can invade the healthy tissue in which they developed from, destroying that healthy tissue. Or they can invade healthy tissues elsewhere in your body. These cancer cells can travel through your blood vessels and your circulatory system or through your lymph system, and transplant elsewhere, creating tumors in other parts of your body. This is called metastasis. You may have heard before, you know, oh, how is so-and-so doing? And they say, oh, well, their cancer spread. Well, that means that the cancer metastasized. It has now moved and formed a mass elsewhere in the body. And as Alana mentioned before, there are multiple types of cancer. There is no one type of cancer. There's greater than 100 of them. Each of these names are usually based on the type of tissue from which they develop. So now, what is a tumor? 
Well, we need to first talk about two terms, benign and malignant. You may have heard these terms before. You've probably heard of the terms benign and malignant. Well, a tumor that is benign is a growth that is not cancerous. It's generally localized and kept to one specific area. It has not spread. It hasn't invaded any healthy tissue. They're usually not harmful and they usually grow very slowly. Now, a benign tumor is generally very easily removed and usually doesn't come back. However, if the tumor is very large, it may cause pressure and it could pose an issue, even if it's benign. Well, the opposite of our benign tumors are our malignant tumors. Malignant tumors are the exact opposite. They can invade healthy tissue. They could spread to other parts of your body. They can break away and travel through your lymphatic and your blood vessels and cause masses elsewhere. Now, your body is made out of trillions and trillions of cells. <clears throat> cells need to constantly be replaced. I go like this, I'm losing skin cells. We're losing billions of red blood cells every second, every minute, and so on. So we need to replace those that are lost. You cut yourself, cells are replaced that get damaged. When you're developing, when you're growing, more cells are formed. So this is normal cell division, where cells replace uh, those that are needed. One cell can simply divide into two cells, and those two cells can divide into four cells. This is called mitosis, when cells divide. Now, when cells divide, there is a mechanism that makes sure that they don't keep dividing indefinitely. There is a way to make sure that your cells uh, don't continually divide. However, if these mechanisms are mutated, these mechanisms in the form of your DNA, your genetic material, if they get mutated, then we might see down here in the bottom picture that the cells have some uncontrolled growth. Now usually when you have some sort of a mutation, cells have the ability to notice this and they might undergo uh, a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. A cell might realize something's wrong and something is out of hand and the cell actually commits suicide so that it doesn't reproduce and make more cells that are similar to itself. However, if you have a certain number of mutations in certain genes that are important in regulating the cell cycle, then these cells may divide and grow uncontrollably here in our bottom picture. Now there are three steps to the development of cancer. At the top we see we have a normal cell. It's not working so green. Our normal cell is just like your regular average body cell. However, as your cells get exposed to certain chemicals or radiation or viruses and so on, it may damage your DNA. Damaging your DNA can cause mutations. This is called the initiation phase. During the initiation phase, we have certain genes that control the cell division system. These types of genes are called proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Our proto-oncogenes um, help to limit cell growth and cell differentiation. And if these get mutated, then it might lead to uncontrolled growth. The tumor suppressor genes inhibit cell division, so if these genes get mutated as well, then we're not going to be able to inhibit cell division or trigger apoptosis, trigger the, the self-suicide of that mutated cell. So this is initiation when there are a series of genes that are important in regulating the cell cycle and they get mutated. Now, as you're exposed to additional chemicals, this, um, other genes that also are proto-oncogenes or other tumor suppressor genes may also become mutated. And as this occurs, this is promotion. Until eventually, we have so much DNA damage that the cell division mechanism is out of control and we start to form a malignant tumor. Now to show you an example of how uh, cancer occurs in these predictable steps, we can look at one specific type of cancer which is colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer develops in the colon or the rectum, 
which is the last portion of your uh, large intestine. And you have epithelial cells that line this organ. Here we see we have normal striated epithelial cells. These are health, this is healthy tissue. However, after the initiation phase, we have some genetic mutations, some sort of chemicals or radiation um, has damaged the DNA, has damaged the genes that are integral in making sure that the cells um, don't divide if they have damaged DNA or um, kill the cell if they have damaged DNA. So now we have a small benign growth. Is this cancer? No, this is not cancer yet. This is just the, the initiation phase. A couple of genes have been mutated, but just a couple of genes are not enough to develop cancer. So this might be like a polyp or a cyst. Then as additional mutations are acquired, this is now is the um, progression phase, phase, and I'm sorry, the promotion phase, and we start to have a larger growth. But this larger growth, is this cancer? No, it's still not cancer. This is a benign growth. It's still localized. Notice that it has a specific shape to it. It's like a polyp or a cyst. However, once it just gets right over that edge and we have just the right number of mutations that are going to be in these proto-oncogenes and these tumor suppressor, suppressor genes, which help to make sure that these cells don't divide indefinitely, we can then develop a malignant tumor. This malignant, malignant tumor, as you can see here, is actually invading the healthy tissue. And these cells can spread and metastasize. Again, metastasizing is when the cells enter the bloodstream or the lymphatic system and invade other tissues, causing cancer in other organs. So I'm gonna pass the talk over now to Alana for a little bit, and she's gonna talk about the history of cancer as well as our current modern techniques. Great, thank you. And, and first, before moving on from some of the, the issues we just discussed, cancers are also divided into pretty broad cancer categories. And cancers throughout the body tend to be named and grouped based on the type of tissue they involve, um, as well as where it occurs and the type of cells that, that are in those tissues. So, General names include the carcinomas. These are the cancers of the skin and the internal organ linings. Uh, the, all of these cells secrete matter. And so examples include uh, some of the skin cancers, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, also hepatocarcinoma, hepato for liver, liver cancer. Another broad topic are the sarcomas. These type of cancers involve the body's connective tissue, the bone, the fat, the muscle, uh, of, one of the bone cancers, osteo, osteo for bone, osteosarcoma is one type in this category. Next we have the leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, the leukemias are those cancers coming from blood forming tissue, the blood cells that are formed in the bone marrow and then, and then migrate around the body. Uh, the lymphomas are from cells of the immune system very commonly arising in the lymph nodes. There are some cancers too that seem to to bridge both of these two groups. Uh, the myeloma, specifically multiple myeloma, is a cancer that involves immune cells, plasma cells, that are formed in the bone marrow. So, so there can be overlap. Another broad cancer category, though, includes the CNS cancers, cancers of the central nervous system. These are all nervous system cancers, uh, different cancer cells, and they have names like astrocytoma and glioblastoma multiforme, but they are all, they all derive from, from nerve tissue. So we've talked about the, what cancer is, and it'll now be good to just think about when we first really started to, to learn about cancer. And cancer has certainly been around ever since humans have, but we've really only understood what it, what it, what it is for the, for the last several hundred years. Uh, starting in the 1600s, in the 17th century, the first autopsies were done. So this was the first time that cancers were actually seen. They weren't well understood, uh, but, but they were seen. 100 years later, in the 1700s, uh, Giovanni Morgagni in, in Italy was the first person to actually 
take autopsies a step further and really study the tissues that were there for the first time linking the diseased tissue with the illnesses that, that people had, had, had died from. At about the same time, a Scottish surgeon named John Hunter uh, was the first to suggest that, that some cancers might be cured by surgery. Now, surgery in the 1700s was not something that anyone would want anything to do with, you know, between blood loss and infection, and we're going to talk later about the great strides that have, have occurred. Uh, but what's so interesting is that even in this rudimentary you know, surgery time, the thought was that if you could remove a cancer before it invaded tissue, and, and the term that was used actually was while it is still movable, then the person could be cured. And so I, I think that was really the first time where the idea that cancers could be staged, that, that the whole idea of metastasis was very important, and that if a cancer was treated early, that the, the outcome could be so much better. In the 1800s, Surgery is able to take a great step forward with the growth of anesthesia. This, during this time, uh, some of, of the classic cancer operations were developed and occurred, and at the same time, the invention of modern microscopes enabled for, <coughs> for the tissues that were removed to actually be studied um, and, and, and understood so much, so much more. So to take us now into the modern era, across you know, the last hundred years, we really should think about the, the etiologies of, of cancer. So etiology is a fancy word for cause of disease. So in the 20th and 21st century, we have developed great understanding in, in where cancers come from. And as Peter mentioned, it, some cancers come from our genes and, and, our, and our understanding of the genetic links with cancer really progressed and, and in some ways started in the 1950s and 60s uh, with the work of doctors Watson and Crick who discovered the exact chemical structure of DNA. So we know that DNA is in every cell of our body. Our genes are within that DNA. And, and as Peter outlined, the genes can be turned on and off to be making more or less cells around the body. So those oncogenes, those tumor suppressor genes, um, the they have direct links with forming the tumors that, that were mentioned. So at the level of DNA, we know that too much or too little activity can directly lead to cancers. Now, this idea of too much or too little can really be very true at the cellular level as well. And in recent decades, cancer biologists and immunologists have learned that too much or too little inflammation in the body can also be very harmful. So when I mention the word inflammation, we can think of it as you know, a local physical condition with swelling and discomfort. So if you sprain your ankle, your ankle's gonna swell up, it, it's gonna be painful, but that swelling can be a good thing. It's a blessing to have inflammation in your body because the cells that are responding to that injury are there to reduce the harm to get rid of the damaged cells and to help produce healing. Um, similarly, for anyone ever diagnosed with strep throat, you know that the pain you're having, the swelling that you're having in your throat is a nuisance at the time, but it actually is a sign that your body's inflammation system, your immune system is working. So inflammatory cells are created by bone marrow, in the lymph, bone marrow and in the lymph nodes, these are B, B cells, T cells, they travel around the body. I like to think of them as like a Roomba vacuum, you know, sort of moving around a room and, and somehow knowing what to pick up and, and, and by the end of the day finishes the whole room. And so these cells are actually just, just moving around trying to fix what is wrong in the body. And so we know, though, that when some of these inflammatory cells encounter precancerous cells or malignant tissue, they can be influenced by those cells, hijacked, sort of speak, and then send out signals inappropriately that can lead to cancer growth. And so that's one way where the body's own immune system can actually contribute to cancer growth. Another way that inflammation can be related to cancer is, is just the nature of inflammatory disorders themselves. And so there are 
there's a very long list of inflammatory disorders. Similarly, as, as there are so many different cancers, um, there essentially the many types of inflammatory disorders that exist are, are very much linked with the idea of the body's inflama inflammatory system, the body's immune system, making too much inflammation or inflammation in the wrong way. So one example is ulcerative colitis, one of the inflammatory bowel disorders. disorders. In that disorder, the inflammatory cells that are produced can actually become cancerous. And so there is, for some patients with ulcerative colitis, they are more likely to develop colon cancer. The mechanism is, is somewhat similar to the idea of a, of a chocolate factory. You know, if you're, and I'll get back to the chocolate factory in a sec, but if your body is making thousands of cells, and it suddenly, it's supposed to make a thousand, but instead it starts making millions, well then there, there's a higher likelihood for those increased number of cells to have more mutations. You know, if you were just making a small amount, maybe there would be just a couple of mutations. So the chocolate factory analogy is just that, you know, if a chocolate factory makes, you know, a thousand chocolates in an hour, but maybe one or two might have a nick or a blemish. If the chocolate factory is making 20,000 an hour, you're gonna have that many more. And so, so the, the thought is that there are inflammatory disorders that, that, that again, not all, but here and there can be linked with, with certain um, types of cancer. Now, I, I spent a, a fair amount of time on inflammation because when we talk about treatment in a few minutes, it's just a fascinating, somewhat newer type of treatment because just as the body's immune system can contribute to cancer, a very hot topic in cancer treatment is to use the body's immune system to actually fight cancer. And so we'll get to that in a, in a couple minutes. So the next couple of etiologies are a bit more straightforward and, and, and one is infection. And so Peter pointed out that there are no cancers in humans that are contagious and that's absolutely the case but there are infections that can, in some people, lead to cancers. So again, not that these infections, you know, that, not that the cancers are contagious, but the prevention or awareness of these infections is, is very important because we know that long-standing infection with hepatitis B or hepatitis C can lead to liver cancer. We know that HIV is linked with, with several cancers, including Kaposi's sarcoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We know that HPV, many of us know even more about HPV you know, in, in recent months having participated in the common read and, and, and reading about Henrietta Lacks. We know that HPV, human papillomavirus, is a virus that can lead to cancer of the cervix as well as other genital cancers um, and also cancers of the head and neck. Last etiology or cause of disease are the carcinogens. And so a carcinogen is a cancer causing agent that can alter cells, causing them to become cancerous. And, and there are greater than 100 different types of carcinogens identified. Examples include tobacco, ionizing radiation from the sun and other sources, as well as hydrocarbons like benzene, asbestos. So quite a long list. Okay. So we've talked about how cancer happens and now let's talk about how it can be treated. And, and I think that the whole, the whole field of cancer I've always found very interesting because it, it is a fight. You have a tumor or you have diseased tissue and you're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And, and I, I'm actually a pediatrician, but throughout my career I have, have studied cancer and worked with, with cancer patients. And, um, and some of our, you know, every year we have patients in our practice who are undergoing cancer treatment. Um, but again, throughout my learning, I've just always felt that this was a really just interesting disease paradigm. And if we were, as we go through these treatments, I'm just going to ask everyone to imagine that if you had a tumor in front of you, if you had this big lump of, of cells, and you were trying to decide how to get rid of it, and I think that as we go through some of these details, just keeping that in mind would, would be helpful to think about the, the different topics. So you can remove it. You could use surgery to get rid of it. You could radiate it. You could try to shrink it with, with radiation. You could give it medicine that would make it shrink. You could, you could cut off its blood supply. So these are some of the topics that we're gonna go through just to talk about the cancer treatments. So actually, I was already on surgery. So let's do surgery. The, 
I mentioned surgery flourished in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, this was a time, like I said, that the classic cancer surgeries were developed. Um, but they involved removing cancer as well as large amounts of normal tissue. So the radical mastectomy was developed at this time, and, and that's the removal of, of all breast tissue for the treatment of breast cancer. And in recent decades, though, our understanding of metastasis and our understanding and our development of more technical expertise has really led to surgeries where the, the, there's a minimization of the removal of normal tissue. And so now more women are having lumpectomies due to the removal of smaller amounts of, of breast tissue. Um, it, Similarly, in other types of cancers, you know, the osteosarcomas that I mentioned or other bone cancers, there, there are less amputations. There's more areas where just small amounts are removed. Um, and, and in colon cancer, smaller sections of colon are, are, are able to be removed as well. And that's in part, too, because surgery is not the only option anymore. A tumor can be removed, and then other treatments can be used to further lead to cure. So another great point in the development of the surgery treatment option is uh, the development of imaging. So since the 1970s, the development of the ultrasound, the CAT scan, the MRI has led to great understanding and progress in diagnosing and staging cancers. So years ago, people would undergo exploratory surgeries just to find where the cancer is, and that does not happen anymore. You get pictures that show where everything is, and so the surgeon can go in in a much more limited way that is beneficial for everybody. So getting back to our big tumor, we could also radiate it. We could use radiation to shrink that tumor, and, and the x-ray was also developed in the 1890s. Um, a lot was happening in the 1890s into the, into the 1900s. Um, invented then, a few years later, discovered that it could be used as a treatment for, for certain tumors. A few years after that, it was discovered that the x-ray could actually lead to certain cancers. And so, interestingly, researchers on some of the early x-ray machines used to use their own arms to see what was called an erythema dose, like erythema being redness, where they would put their arms out and just see how much radiation they could put before their skin got red. And, and unfortunately, years later, many of these researchers developed, um, developed leukemias because of that. But in recent decades, radiation is still used very, very prevalently, but Getting back to computer technology and expertise, we now are able to, to deliver much, sm much larger amounts of radiation to much smaller spaces, minimizing the harm to normal tissue. And so radiation, too, in recent decades has just had great progress. So next, on to chemotherapy, a term that, that most people have heard of, and, and that is using medicines to try to decrease tumor size. And there are over you know, there are hundreds of, of chemotherapies, many of which were discovered to damage cells or, or prevent replication, um, often discovered by accident, though. Researchers, scientists would be studying a particular chemical or a particular med that happened to, in a mouse with a tumor, cause shrinkage of the tumor, and then, you know, realized that, that wow, this, 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 this medicine could be used in, in a new way. And what has happened in recent decades is that newer combinations of, of various chemotherapies have, have been very successful, and, and patients now often enter clinical trials in which researchers are able to monitor who does better when, when receiving certain, certain chemotherapies for certain periods of time, and so we're getting better and better at understanding which combinations work best. Now, just as surgery and radiation has, have gotten better at targeting the actual cancer cells, the chemotherapies have gotten better and better at, at targeting just the, the, just the cancer cells, the cells that, that need to die. Um, there are plenty of rapidly producing cells around your body that you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to affect. And, and, and that is why actually people who, who experience or who are undergoing chemotherapy often have 
horrible side effects, you know, because the, the cells, the good cells of their gastrointestinal tract are being affected, and so they're going to have, you know, gastrointestinal side effects. And so the, the chemotherapies are getting better at targeting those cells, and also we have more and more medicines to combat those side effects. So even in my two decades in medicine, the, the anti-nausal medicine options have come such a long way. And so, uh, you know, we really just see adults and, and certainly kids just so much better treated and tolerating, you know, chemo is better. Unfortunately, there's still plenty of nausea. And, you know, interestingly, I've heard this in, in, in adults, but certainly have seen it in kids that as they're recovering from from a, a period of chemotherapy, just starting to be able to eat, there's one food that most kids will say they can eat, and they are always going to try to pick it up, and it's McDonald's French fries. And it's just amazing that, like, kid after kid, like, that's what they want. And, and where I am in, in Connecticut, similar to Long Island, where, four, you know, the LAE runs across the middle of Long Island, 95 runs across the bottom of Connecticut, and, and Yale Children's Hospital is right in the middle, and so we have some kids going up the highway, you know, to get home, and some kids going down the highway to get home, and there's a McDonald's on both, and they're, they're always stopping to get their french fries for the, for the way home. So uh, to move on from, from to a different type of chemotherapy, because again, chemo, chemotherapy is really any medicine, but hormone therapy is one particular type, and, and we've known for a long time that there are certain hormones that can cause cancers to get bigger. Estrogen can cause certain breast cancers to, to enlarge. Testosterone has been linked with certain prostate and testicular cancers. And so we can think of hormones as, as fuel on the cancer fire. And, and in order to try to get rid of that fuel, we want to block that hormone influence. Uh, an example in, includes tamoxifen, which is a, a medicine used for quite some time, um, for decades, in breast cancer. And, and it blocks the estrogen receptor on um, cancer cells to, to inhibit that way to cause growth. So two more. The, Targeted therapy, an example of targeted therapy is, is are the anti-angiogenesis agents, which, which I'll explain. This is actually my, my favorite category within here, in part, um, just because I, I think it's just an elegant way to think about, again, how to shrink a tumor, how to get rid of a tumor. It also was, it just came about right when I was in medical school, so it was a really hot topic that everybody was talking about. And, and essentially, when we, when when we think of tu all tumors, all, all living cells need food and water. They need blood vessels to, to deliver a blood supply. And so starting in the 1970s, Dr. Judah Folkman in Boston tried to come up with ways that you could cut off the blood supply to tumors and use that as a way of treatment. And so angio meaning blood, genesis being new, so angiogenesis is the creation of new blood supply, and you want to, so, so his anti-angiogenesis agents were ways to, again, decrease the, um, the ability for those, those vessels to form. So again, started this work in the, the 1970s, talked about in the 1990s, and the early 2000s was the, the first uh, drug approved uh, called, happen to be called Avastin, and it, it blocks a particular type of vascular growth factor. So it, it prevents blood vessels from being able to proliferate and, and to grow, and, and in that way, causing tumors to shrink. So lastly, we're going to talk about how the body's own immune system can be used to fight cancers. Now, remember that the immune system's role in clearing the body's garbage, you know, sort of clearing up like that vacuum, the B cells, T cells moving around. Since the 1990s, there have been immune therapies in which the body is given antibodies that actually can bind cancer cells, and then those B cells, T cells traveling around can actually recognize those antibodies and then fight to get rid of, of those cancer cells. So again, you're using the antibodies to, to sort of relay to the body's own immune system that this is not a cell that it should allow to, to keep around. And similar approaches were studied in the 1970s by uh, Dr. Ralph Steinman, and I'm going to just highlight his work to finish with our treatment section, in part uh, because I, I think his work really has been cutting edge and is, is going to 
be somewhat similar to what we're going to see in, in future therapies. Um, but unfortunately, Dr. Steinman was actually diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the, in the mid-2000s, and he used himself as his greatest research subject, and, and actually, uh, because of that, likely lived several years after he, he was um, predicted to. Uh, he died in 2011, unfortunately, just three days prior to being awarded the Nobel Prize for his work, um, and actually just right over the river in, in, at Rockefeller University in Manhattan. And he worked for decades on the dendritic cell. So let me just point up here. You can see the, the dendritic cell is one of the body's immune cells. It has, it has dendrites, those arm-like, finger-like projections coming out. So one idea behind part of his work is that if you were to give someone cancer proteins, specific proteins based on the type of cancer that they have, these cancer proteins could be picked up by the dendritic cells. Let's go down to two there where you see your body's own T cell could actually come, recognize, be sensitized, be aware of that protein. And then as it moves around the body, if it encounters a true cancer cell, it's primed to recognize it and to destroy that cell. So again, this is sort of a, just a, a cartoon example of how you can actually use the body's own immune system to, to fight cancer. So we've gone through now what cancer is. We've talked about how it happens. We've talked about how it can be treated. We're now going to talk about how we can lower uh, the risk of individuals getting cancer. So there are many ways that you can reduce your risk to developing cancer, and one would be no tobacco. Uh, tobacco contains a lot of different carcinogens, which can uh, increase your risk of developing cancer. Uh, lowering the amount that you smoke and cutting down will even lower your chances of developing certain cancers like lung, bladder, cervix, kidney, and pancreas, and so on. And it's also a great way to save money. Second, your diet is very important. What you eat and what you put into your body is extremely important. You should have a healthy diet that's low in fat and low in alcohol and high in things like fruit and vegetables and whole grains and beans. Having a healthy uh, diet can help decrease your chances of breast cancer and colon cancer, kidney, liver, and so on. Next, you want to have a healthy lifestyle. You should have a nice amount of sleep every night. I doubt everybody here is getting more than seven hours of sleep a night. I know I didn't last night. So you should have a nice length of uninterrupted sleep. You should also have a decent amount of physical activity during your day. 30 minutes to 45 minutes of some exercising is very, very healthy. Next we see avoiding the sun. A lot of people here I know like to tan. Personally, I like to tan as well. I like to go to the beach. However, there are certain things you should do to protect yourself. You can stay in the shade. You can avoid the midday sun when it is the strongest. You can put on a sun tanning lotion. Nope, not a sun tanning lotion. You want to put on a sunscreen, something with a high SPF factor. SPF is um, sun protection factor. You want to avoid tanning beds at all costs. So. Cover exposed areas and wear something with a high SPF. Avoid risky behaviors, such as IV drug use, no sharing needles. This could increase your risk of contracting HIV or hepatitis, which can lead to, as Alana said, multiple types of cancers, like Carposi sarcoma, as well as liver cancer. When you're having sex, you want to make sure you wear a condom and limit your number of partners. Limiting this and being protected will help you to lower your risk of developing HIV and HPV. Finally, I have a safe work and home environment. Who here does research on campus? Who here is working in a research facility? Quite a few hands I see raised. A lot of people, whether it's in a research facility or whether you are in a uh, laboratory setting of some sort, you want to make sure that you are undergoing the proper protection and wearing a mask or wearing gloves when you're handling certain chemicals. Same thing when you're at home. We have toxic substances in our own home, like bleach. 
you want to make sure that you're practicing the correct preventative measures to make sure that you are not exposing yourself to any of these harmful chemicals. Now, last August, QCC went tobacco free, so that is one great way of limiting your encounters with uh, either firsthand or secondhand smoke. Alana's going to continue with some additional ways medically to reduce your risk. Great. And so there are vaccines that can prevent some of the infections that are linked with certain cancers. And so the hepatitis B vaccine is an excellent way to prevent that, that illness. It's actually given in three parts. Uh, to, it's recommended for all infants now. We give it at two, four, and six months of age to lower uh, their risk of contracting a hepatitis B later on. He HPV, human papillomavirus. The vaccine for HPV was first approved in 2006. It is also a three-part vaccine uh, given, and then the second one two months later, the third one four months after that. I know that Dr. Danzi's um, class actually did a fantastic presentation on HPV this morning, and you know, in it there was there was full discussion on HPV as an entity, and, and actually that the vaccine covers some of the strains of HPV that are most likely to cause cancer. So while there are, you know, I keep using the term hundreds, but there are actually that many HPV strains, um, a few of them are the ones most notably linked with cancer, and those are the ones that the vaccine actually covers. We give this vaccine in our office. We recommend it for all kids 11 and above. We when it came out years ago, it was at first only recommended for girls uh, because of the known link with cervical cancer. We, we expected and we knew that eventually it, it really should and would be recommended for boys as well. And that actually happened last year because it also is linked with other genital as well as head and neck cancers. So we, we, do, we do give it in our office, we explain it as a, as a cancer vaccine. And, and I thought this was just an interesting topic to cover in this audience because many of you may be in your 20s, many of you may have already gotten the HPV vaccine, but you, it's possible that some people are just old enough that you may not have been part of the recommendation to get it when you were either a tween or, or, or a teenager. Um, it is something recommended for people in their 20s or at risk beyond, and so it, it certainly is, is a health issue uh, worth speaking with your doctors about. The last piece of cancer prevention we should just talk about regular medical care and screening as i just mentioned in seeing your doctor for regular medical visits there are going to be numerous ways in which you're going to be able to uh, prevent cancer your your doctor is going to ask you about your family history and depending on that family history and depending on whether or not you have had close relatives who have had certain types of cancer he or she may recommend certain types of genetic testing. Also, just by the nature of having a physical exam, there is going to be a breast exam, a skin exam, a testicle exam that, that is going to pick up something that could be off and, and should be discussed. Uh, for women going to the gynecologist at annual visits, a, um, a pap smear is done, which is an examination of the cervix. There's a, a swab that's done. Uh, those cells are then analyzed for HPV for the presence of, of um, cancerous cells, uh, pap smear being named after Dr. Papanicolaou, who, uh, who first came up with the technique. The Blood work may be recommended at, at an annual physical exam, and depending on, age, on your own age would depend on whether or not there would be a direct link with some of that blood work having to do with cancer. Um, men at, at certain ages would be recommended um, to have blood work done looking for prostate cancer through the PCA, the prostate-specific antigen. Um, at certain ages, there are colonoscopies, video looks inside the colon that screen individuals for colon cancer. So again, just by the nature of going to the doctor, you're going to get screened. Um, it's also important to consider self-exams, though. You can yourself conduct breast exams, testicle exams, skin exams. You know, we tell kids all the time that if you notice a change in your body, you should let your parent know. And as adults, you should let your doctors know. Um, and to talk a little bit more about the skin exam, Peter will finish with that. 
So one way that you can help to prevent the onset of, or development of cancer is to really check your body and to know your body. And one example is to look at your skin. We call it the ABCDEs of skin cancer. First, we see that we have here our A for asymmetry. The blemish on the left is in fact symmetrical, round in shape, but the blemish on the right is asymmetrical. There is a difference <clears throat> in the two halves. So each half, each side of the blemish is different. Next we have border. Right here we have the borders are even and we see that they are regular and they are very well defined. And here we have our borders uneven, they are very poorly defined and they're almost scalloped. C stands for color. We see that this blemish on the left consists of only one color, but the one on the right has two colors. It's varied from one side to the other. Sometimes colors are also indicative of something being um, problematic, something that is either white or red or blue, you may consider getting checked out. Diameter is also important. Skin cancers are usually larger than a quarter inch, which is also um, uh, six millimeters. It's the size of the head of a pencil. So if you have anything that's larger than the size of the head of a pencil, it may be something that you may want to have looked into. Things that are smaller than a quarter inch are nothing to worry about. Our last letter is E for evolving. If you notice something change on your body over time, then this is something that you should also consult your physician about. On the left, we have an ordinary mole. And on the left here, we, we have an ordinary mole. And on the right, we see that it has changed over time. It has become darker. It has become larger. The borders are now irregular. So these are things that you need to, uh, to take precaution of to make sure that you are uh, preventing the onset of skin cancer. Now, a lot of this was heavy, I understand, talking about what, how cancer develops, what is cancer, how do we treat cancer, and so on, but there is good news. There is increased cancer survivorship, meaning that more people are surviving, more people are beating being diagnosed with cancer. This is due to the growth in our knowledge of cancer biology. Because we have so much research, conducted not just here, but across the world, we have a lot of progress in early detection, finding that somebody has cancer before it has progressed so far that it has spread throughout the body. The advancements in treatment that Alana has presented to you, as well as cancer prevention, we have learned ways to lower your risk of developing cancer. Now, compared to a few decades ago, where the prognosis for people facing cancer was um, pretty much not very favorable, now there is some good news. Looking at the 1970s, we see that about one of two people that were diagnosed with cancer survived at least five years. Now, that number is much better. More than two of three will survive that long. The overall rate of diagnosis is also increasing, as well as the amount of deaths. So less people are being diagnosed with cancer. This is most likely due to the fact that we have identified these carcinogens, which are these chemicals that are causing the development of cancer. And since less people are being diagnosed, less people are therefore dying. And with these increased treatments, less people are going to be dying from cancer. Last year alone, the American Cancer Society funded $66 million in cancer treatment research and more than $77 million in cancer control, survivorship, and outcomes research. So through donations, through research, we are able to discover new ways to prevent, treat, and prolong the lives of people with cancer. So I'd love to personally thank Queensborough Community College, especially in the back, Susan Madeira. Thank you. Susan is extremely organized and has done an incredible job selecting a great book for the common read. 
For those of you here who have not read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, I highly encourage you to read it. <clears throat> the author, Rebecca Skloot, for being a very determined, uh, what's the word? Persistent. Uh, yeah, persistent, um, uh, uh, tenacious, yeah, keep going, Susan, there you go. Um, hardworking journalist to really fight and find out all the information behind Henrietta. Thank you to everybody who he, uh, was able to attend today, and a special thanks to my cousin Alana, who took time out of her very busy life, came down from Connecticut in the snow to come and spend some time and talk with you guys. If anybody has any questions, uh, we have a couple minutes. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I happen to have a question. We talked about um, SPF. What do you recommend if someone's going to the beach and they recommend that they protect themselves? What, what's the appropriate number that you should use? They come in all different numbers from four, I've seen up to 50. Yes, and I, I can give a gut impression answer to that, not necessarily based on you know, possibly the latest data, but you know the general, at least a few years ago when, when I remember discussing this with some of my colleagues, there was some literature suggesting that much over 35 or 40 is probably not gonna make a difference, but that you should at least be applying SPF of 30 or higher. And again, that, that's sort of my gut impression of, of that question, but the uh, at least 30. You know, the, the SPF 8 is basically, you know, is, is one step up from a tanning oil. And so, um, so I, I would say, if, if I had to say one number, I would say 30 or above. And along the lines of, of what Peter was mentioning about the, the different types of, of moles, you know, moles can appear throughout one's life. And that, you know, it's interesting that, that we see kids in the office come in in August and the parents will point out, well, this one's new, this one's new, this one's new, and, and they get them from being in the sun, you know, all summer. And uh, interestingly, too, apparently the, the typical age at which you can stop seeing moles appear is 40, and I'm turning 40 this year, and I noticed a new one the other day, and I thought, oh, is this going to be my last one? Or, um, but I do actually... I've heard people say that they get them, you know, all the time, or they start getting aging spots instead of mold. But the bottom line is, is that the molds of concern, as Peter mentioned, can come in a variety of different ways. And and anything, regardless of size or shape, if it doesn't look like others that you similarly have, or if it has changed, um, you know, any mold can be a problem, but most are not. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? I do. I can always walk over and turn. Hi. Um, thank you for coming, by the way. That was extremely informative, fun. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, my question is, do you know why the HPV vaccine is only recommended for women up in their 20s and not for women that are older than that? I actually asked Alana that yesterday. I said. Uh, I never received the HPV vaccine. Is this something that I should be looking into? Not just for women, but for men now as well, and I do. And I don't have a good answer for that. I do have an answer for that, but unfortunately it is based on insurance coverage and mon monetary payment. It's a fairly expensive vaccine, and so insurance companies cover it for young males and females into, I believe, up until the age of about 26. Um, the thought being that there are many ways to get HPV, but it's considered a sexually transmitted disease. And the thought being that as people get older, um, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they may be less likely to have multiple partners and may be less likely to contract HPV. That uh, being said, that that is a ridiculous reason not to get a vaccine if you may be um, at risk for the issue. And, and I believe with time, insurance companies are gonna be getting better at paying for it. And some, I think depending on your plan and depending on, on your exact type of insurance coverage, it may. Uh, but I actually, I had a mom in my 
office last week and I was privately speaking with her about giving the HPV vaccine to her daughters and she mentioned how infuriated she was that she asked her doctor about getting it and she found out that it wasn't covered. And so I think she chose to pay for it, but, but I think that there's a money piece to that question. I, I think that's a good point, but the serotypes is... Yeah. Now, just in case everybody didn't hear, Monica said if you've already been in contact with HPV, that receiving the vaccine will be pointless. However, again, getting back to the fact that there are hundreds of different strains of HPV, you, individuals may be infected with one or two strains, no, 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 but it, for instance, the, the vaccine specifically covers HPV um, serotype 11, 16, and 18. Those are the ones very specifically linked with, uh, with, with cervical cancer. So you may have 11, but if you get the vaccine and that helps to prevent e, you know, serotype 18, then you're gonna be protected because you didn't have serotype 18. And that, it's actually either 16 or 18, that's the real nasty one. 18. And so, so you, you want to make sure that you cover your bases. We get the same thought in the office for the annual flu vaccines. You know, so we know that we give the flu vaccine, it covers certain serotypes, but every year there may be a serotype that comes through that didn't cover the vaccine, and that's the one that all the kids are getting. Yes. I have a question also. First, I'd like to thank you both for coming here. It's very informative. Um, usually, the guidelines, I believe, for the American, from the American Cancer Association say that a woman should get her first mammal at 40. Since a lot of women are being diagnosed prior to 40, are there ch guidelines going to change or are there certain recommendations that women should know about before they reach that age? Sure. And in the 1990s, the recommendation was definitely at 40. And that's what I learned in medical school. And, and in the past decade, though, I believe that it, I believe that it may now be 35. Um, the, I think another very relevant point, though, is that gynecologists for any women in their 20s and 30s will ask them about their family history because any woman with a first degree relative, um, a, a, a parent or a sister should absolutely get a mammogram. I believe the general rule is around the time that that, or, or five, five to 10 years before that woman was diagnosed. And so I actually have a couple friends who have had mammograms in their 20s based on those recommendations. And, and there, there are reasons to bring it up for other reasons. Um, you know, when I was 35, not yet with kids, I said to my gynecologist, well, what if I'm breastfeeding in five years? And they said, and because the, the mammogram, you know, like looking at breast tissue then would not be as, as, as accurate. And so they said, yeah, why don't we, you know, why, why don't we do it early? You know, and, and so that was uh, just a thought that you want to, and again, that was like a ridiculous doctor question of, of you know, thinking ahead, but, um, but the thought was is that it can be individualized. I think that, to answer your question, the, the age is coming lower. Okay. But on the other hand, there's a big question in the scientific and the medical community about the value, the real value of these very often in the moment. It's, it's out there, and the results are not particularly clear about the real advantage of mammal. Yes, and I think that's true for a couple things that are still currently recommended, like the breast self-exam. Yeah. It's really hard to get data as to how, you know, how helpful it is, um, but it's still part of medical practice, and, and, and I think that right now I, I haven't heard the current recommendations for, for routine mammography changing too much. I think it is being debated. I think that the recommendations for colonoscopy has, has also changed and that it used to be once you're 50, if you don't have much of a risk, and then at, you know, 10 years later, but now some gastroenterologists are actually recommending it earlier than that. You know, so it is, it's a dynamic topic. Are there any other questions? 
Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Susan. For coming here. Let's give them a great round of applause, please. This has been very informative, and I appreciate you coming the distance. I love the family aspect. I want to thank the family for, for coming as well. We refer to them as the colleagues. Thank you to the colleagues for being here today. Um, I ask that you just consider what you've learned today. Do the self-exams. Speak to your doctor. You've been educated. Take that knowledge and move forward with it. Don't let it just go by the wayside. This can help to save your life or the life of a loved one. So thank you very much, and have a great day.